Hello and welcome to Sat TV Week, the news programme for the international satellite industry. This week, Helen Jameson talks to Frank McKenna, president of ILS. James Saltland looks at the oil and gas via satellite market. And we have news of two launches set for tomorrow. But first, here's Carrie Ann with the news headlines. NPOSP has signed a landmark deal with Newtek to become its first third party repair centre for Russia, the Ukraine, and other CIS countries. The agreement will cover all warranty and post warranty repairs of Newtek equipment sold in the region. The contract recognises NPOSP as an authorised repair centre. The company will continue to its role as a distributor of Newtek products, but will also handle all Newtek equipment in the region that requires attention. Until now, all repairs were carried out at Newtek's own production facility in Belgium or at regional repair services in Newtek remote support centres. However, this presented a suboptimal solution for customers in different regions where difficulties arose in logistics. SES Astra has announced a cooperation with Deutsche Telekom in Germany to combine Astra's broad satellite free TV offer, including HD+, with Deutsche Telekom's IPTV product, Entertain. The offer will include all free-to-air TV and radio channels in standard and high definition on Astra, including HD+, as well as the typical Entertain services like Video On Demand, a TV archive and an electronic programme guide. Ferdinand Kayser, President and CEO of SES Astra, said the cooperation with Deutsche Telekom demonstrates the strengths of satellite reception and the attractiveness of HD+. Christian Illek, MD Marketing Telekom Deutschland, said the entertained service currently reaches about 20 million households in Germany, adding that with the satellite offer, the company will address new customer groups. Astra's technical reach of more than 16 million satellite households in Germany and the switch-off of the analogue satellite reception in April 2012 represent a particularly interesting and attractive potential for Entertain Sat. Carrie Ann will be back later with more news. 2010 was a really good year for ILS and Khrunichev with eight successful commercial missions. A record number for ILS. Along with four federal protons, the proton launched at the robust rate of one launch per month. Earlier, Helen Jameson talked to Frank McKenna, president of ILS, and started by asking him how the company planned to build on the success of last year. Well, Helen, last year was a remarkable year for ILS with a record achievement of eight commercial launches, and along with the federal missions on Proton, we closed out the year with 12 launches for the year, which is a very robust launch rate of one per month. And that's uh, 29 launches over 29 months, uh, so it's been going very, very well. And what does this year look like for ILS and Proton in terms of launches? Well, this year in 2011 builds on the background that we've had in our increasing our production and quality over the last several years. And for an example, we've increased production over time from six launches in 2005 and 2006 to seven launches in 2007, 10 launches in 2010, uh, 2008 and 2009, and 12 launches in 2010, as I just mentioned. We will have a comparable number in 2011. And can you tell me, are there any proton improvements or enhancements currently underway or planned? Yes, we're uh, very successful in the evolutionary improvements and capabilities that we have implemented on Proton over the year. We've had a 100% success rate on all three phases of upgrades that we've implemented so far. And last year, as you know, the phase three Proton improvements were demonstrated on the EchoStar 14 mission, which was our first uh, commercial mission to use the phase three vehicle. And that weighed in at over uh, 6.3 metric tons for that spacecraft. We are now embarking on the Phase 4 program, which will uh, develop and add another 150 kilograms to performance. And those enhancements will be incorporated into our manifest in 2012. This supports the industry's needs toward heavier spacecraft, hosted payloads, and a variety of new technologies <coughs> that, we, that we've been seeing particularly uh, as an example, the launch of KA-band satellites for Eutelsat, Viasat, Yasat, 
as well as a hybrid terrestrial system that was launched last year on Proton for Skyterra, which is very exciting in the industry. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Communic Asia 2011, Asia's largest knowledge-based ICT platform is the most recognized one-stop knowledge platform for digital multimedia and entertainment technology. Tomorrow sees the launch of two satellites, NASA's Glory and the US Air Force's second orbital test vehicle. Trisha Jones reports. NASA's Glory spacecraft, which was scheduled to launch last week, but was delayed due to technical issues with ground support equipment for the Taurus XL launch vehicle, is scheduled for launch on Friday, March the 4th. The liftoff from Vandenberg Air Force Base, California, is targeted for 5.09 a.m. EST in the middle of a 48-second launch window. Spacecraft separation should occur 13 minutes after launch. Data from the GLORY mission will allow scientists to better understand how the sun and tiny atmospheric particles called aerosols affect Earth's climate. The Taurus XL also carries the first of NASA's educational launch of nanosatellite missions. This auxiliary payload contains three small satellites called CubeSats, which were designed and created by university and college students. The Atlas V, which will launch the US Air Force's second orbital test vehicle mission, is also set for liftoff on March the 4th. This time from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, with a launch period starting at 3.39 p.m. EST. If the launch scrubs, the next launch attempt is set for March the 5th. The orbital test vehicle is a prototype space plane and the details of the mission are classified. In other news last week, Russia successfully launched a next-generation navigation satellite for its GLONASS global communication system. The GLONASS-K satellite was launched into orbit on Saturday morning from the Northern Placet Space Center by the upgraded Soyuz 2-1B launcher. The launch increases the deployed GLONASS grouping to 23 satellites, one short of the minimum needed to provide 100% global coverage. The Space Shuttle Endeavour is set for its final trip to Launch Pad 39A on Wednesday, March 9, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Six astronauts are targeted to launch aboard the shuttle on April 19. The STS-134 mission to the ISS is the final scheduled flight for Endeavour before it is retired. The shuttle's 3.4-mile journey on the giant crawler transporter is expected to take approximately six hours. Now here's James with the report on the oil and gas fire satellite market. According to NSR's newest market research report, oil and gas fire satellite, challenges within traditional oil and gas markets of the North Sea and Gulf of Mexico limit long-term retail revenue, and future growth will come increasingly from greenfield opportunities. However, despite lower growth, the traditional markets will continue to provide stable revenue opportunities for established satellite players. In total, NSR projects global oil and gas fire satellite revenue will grow from approximately $600 million in 2010 to nearly $1 billion in 2020, yielding total retail revenues of nearly $8.8 .8 billion over the 10-year period. This growth will be driven by new technologies such as high-throughput satellites and the push of oil and gas operations into remote environments where satellite is the only game in town. Claude Rousseau, senior analyst with NSR, said that terrestrial penetration in the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea reduces the value proposition of satellite-based solutions, yet places without terrestrial solutions will be where satellite players see the largest growth, mainly in deep water or northern latitude markets. The Atlantic Ocean will continue to dominate, providing 33% of total retail revenues in 2010, but by 2020 will drop to only 27% of revenue as fast-growing markets in the Indian and Pacific Oceans mature. NSR forecasts the offshore segment will grow at approximately 8% per year to total retail revenues of over $450 million by 2020. Onshore pipelines will also see a push in remote areas, providing growth to the European markets. Thanks, James. And now here's Carrie-Anne with more news. 
Marlink has confirmed delivery and installation of its innovative Sealink VSAT solution on the Atlantic Oilfield Services Oil and Gas Support Unit KS Titan II. Chartered by ExxonMobil, KS Titan II is the second Atlantic Oilfield Services rig to be installed with Marlink's Sealink system. The system will provide the Titan rig with up to 256 kilobits per second bandwidth and eight telephone lines for a multitude of critical offshore applications, including real-time data management and data sharing with sites ashore. Globecom Systems has achieved authorised service provider video partner status from Cisco. This designation recognises Globecom as having fulfilled the training requirements and programme prerequisites to sell, deploy and support Cisco service provider video solutions. The programme enables channel partners to identify, manage and deliver end-to-end -end Cisco business and consumer video solutions for service providers. Using the network as a platform, Cisco solutions allow service providers to maintain sustainable growth and competitive advantage through enhanced service offerings provided by Cisco authorised channel partners. Thanks Carrie-Anne, and that's all for this week. Thank you for watching.